Welcome to Intro to Bible Study and Interpretation. Let me review some logistics of the course with you for just a few minutes, and then we'll get right into the material. You have, well, two books for the course. This one by Graham Goldsworthy, According to Plan. The one you have might have a different cover on it, but there's only one addition to this book. Uh, so whatever copy of this one you buy is fine. Then there's a book by Robert Stein that has two editions. It's called A Basic Guide to Interpreting the Bible. This is the most recent edition. It's the 2011 edition. It's the one that I prefer that you get for this class because it has just a little different material. However, this is the 1994 edition of A Basic Guide to Interpreting the Bible. It's also acceptable if you want to buy this book. On the weeks where you have a reading assignment from Stein, I'll give you page numbers to read in both the 1994 edition and the 2011 edition. So just know that those are the books for the course. This first week, your assignment comes from, well, it's entirely online, from Christian History Magazine about the history of the English Bible. Not only do I want you to learn this material the first week, but I also think this will give you a little extra time to get the books if you need to order them from Amazon or Barnes & Noble or some other online bookseller. The course is going to be divided up into three units. First, we're going to have a unit on the English Bible, which is just one week, really, with a writing assignment due next week. Then we'll have a unit on the rules of interpretation, where we'll talk about how to interpret different kinds of Scripture passages, and then finally, we'll finish the course with a unit on how all of Scripture points to Jesus. And we'll learn how the Bible's one unified story, and how anytime you interpret a passage, you need to figure out how it fits into the larger story of the Bible. You're going to have weekly reading quizzes, and that's how I'm going to hold you accountable for doing the reading each week. At no point are you going to have to sign a statement saying that you've done 100% of the reading. Uh, if you can skim the reading and get the information out that you need to do well on the quiz, that's fine. Uh, if you need to read every word, that's fine too. If you need to do somewhere in between, that's fine too. I recognize that all of you have busy lives. You might be working and taking care of kids and trying to, uh, trying to go through school, and sometimes you might just have a little bit of time to complete your weekly reading assignment, and you might have to skim. The, quest the quizzes each week will be five questions, uh, that uh, covers material that I think you should know if you did the reading with reasonable care. In other words, I'm not going to ask you about minutia, but I'm going to try to ask you about main important points. Then you're going to have a midterm and a final exam, and you'll also have online forums. Each week I'm going to post a discussion question, and you're required to reply to my question once, and then to respond to another classmate's reply once. I'm not going to grade those forum posts in great detail. If you do the required forum posts, then you'll get 100% for that portion of the course. We're going to have three writing assignments throughout the semester. There's going to be one writing assignment on each unit. So your first writing assignment is going to be due Sunday, October 27th at 11.55 p.m. You don't have to have um, any footnotes or bibliography for this. The assignment, as you'll see on the course website, is just to explain how we got the Bible, how it went from its original manuscripts to the English Bibles we hold today, and to explain it in a way that a, a new believer, beginner type, could understand it. One tip that I'd like to give you based on grading previous writing assignments don't feel like that you have to have a long introduction. Some students will take this assignment and then restate the question in the first paragraph and then talk about how this is an important question that we have to address and then by the time they actually get into the meat of it they've already written two or three hundred words. It's only a thousand word assignment so if you take up the first several paragraphs with an introduction that's not really that important anyway then you're shooting yourself in the foot by not giving yourself ample space to really answer the question. So to do well on the assignment, I recommend you have maybe a sentence or two of introduction, then get right into explaining what the question asks. You don't have to repeat the question or say why it's an important question. I think that probably ought to do it.
for the logistics of the course. You can contact me at any point. You're free to email me. Uh, I do have a union email address, vroach at uu.edu, but I put my uh, Gmail on the syllabus, and if you want a quick reply, I recommend you email my Gmail because I just have that open so much of the time, and uh, if you email me there, you'll probably catch me quicker than if you email me at my uu.edu address. I will check my union email address regularly. In fact, I'm going to try to figure out how to forward it to my Gmail, but uh, that's just a tip for contacting me. You're also free to call me. Uh, I know that sometimes email is not the best way to communicate, and you just need to have a conversation with the instructor. And I welcome that. I uh, would like to meet you at least over the phone, so please do call me. My number's on the syllabus. Call me, though, if you would, please, before about 8 p.m. Eastern Time. I live near Louisville, Kentucky, in Shelbyville, Kentucky, and I have a two-year-old and a two-week-old who start going to bed a little after 8 o'clock. Before we get into the, the meat of the course, I do want to address why is this course important. You've signed up for it. It's a requirement, but I think that it's important beyond that. The Bible... Hebrews 4.12 says, is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's a book that will absolutely change your life when you read it and understand it. But the trouble is, sometimes we feel like we're just thrown into the deep end of the pool with the Bible, and we're told to swim, but we don't really know how we're supposed to understand this book. It makes me think of my college years when I was first assigned to read the book Confessions by Augustine. Augustine was a great Christian thinker. He lived from 354 to 430. It had a massive impact on Christianity and on Western culture in general. And one of his most famous books is called Confessions. And it's his personal testimony, essentially, the story of how he became a Christian. Well, the first time I was assigned to read it, I was doing an independent study with a professor who was Jewish, and I think probably agnostic. She was at least hostile toward Christianity, and evangelical Christianity in particular. She didn't tell me much about who Augustine was or what he was trying to do in the Confessions. She didn't tell me how to get a good readable translation. It was written in Latin originally. So I had this translation that was kind of written in Old English, and I didn't know what the book was about, and it just seemed dense and confusing. Well, a few years later, I took a seminar in seminary about Augustine. And I was assigned to read the Confessions again. But this time, the professor, who is a warm-hearted evangelical Christian, explained the importance of Augustine and explained his historical context and why he's important to us. And he got me a good readable translation of the Confessions written in modern English. And I love the Confessions. And just having a good translation and have somebody tell me what Augustine was trying to do in the book and how I should understand it made all the difference in the world between thinking, what, this is confusing, and thinking, I really like this book. The Confessions, as important as it is, is trivial compared to the Bible. And I hope that maybe in this class you'll have just a little microcosm of an experience with the Bible like the one that I had with the Confessions, where finally you'll see what the big picture of the Bible is, what the authors are trying to do, and how you should understand it. I trust you love the Bible already, but getting your feet on solid ground in terms of how to interpret it can make it that much better and that much more life-changing. So let's talk about this first unit for a few minutes. How did we get our Bible? What I'm going to talk to you about for the next few minutes is essentially what I want you to rehash and summarize in your first written assignment. You can draw from our readings as well, but I'm going to try to give you the story here of how the Bible got from the original manuscripts written by the prophets and the apostles to the English Bibles that we hold in our hands today. And if you're following along, I'll give you my headings before I start out. I want to talk to you about the writing of the books, the formation of a canon, the copying of the books, and then the Bible in English. What about the writing of the books? Well, the Old Testament books were all written between about 1300 or 1400 B.C. and 400 B.C. So over a period of a thousand years, the Old Testament books were written. They were written almost entirely in the Hebrew language, though parts of Daniel and parts of Ezekiel and then scattered little verses here and there are in Aramaic. Uh, 
which is a language that's related to Hebrew, but not exactly the same. The New Testament was written in Greek, and all the New Testament books were finished by about the year 100 AD, 100 years after the birth of Christ. You'll find by liberal scholars claims that the New Testament books were written later, but when you really start examining those claims, they don't hold up. There is every reason for us to believe that the New Testament books were written, they were all completed by a hundred years after the time of Jesus. There's lots of evidence for this. For one, as one of the articles that you have read this week mentions, shorthand was a skill that a lot of people had around the time of Jesus. Matthew, as a tax collector and customs official, would have probably have been professionally trained in how to take shorthand and could have written down what Jesus said very quickly and very accurately at an extremely early date and then made that into his books. Uh, Luke chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 in fact tell us that at the time Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke people had already compiled numerous accounts, numerous written accounts of the life and times of Jesus. And Luke tells us that he tried to compile those into an orderly account. So we know there were written sources early. The four Gospels are filled with specific names of people and places from the first century that only a first century eyewitness could have known. There are other people who can talk about this a lot better than I can, and you can delve into some of those sources if you want. But it is important to know that the specific details about cities and people and customs that we find in the Gospels are largely absent from the supposed Gospels that were written in the 2nd and 3rd centuries, other accounts that claim to be authentic, but really aren't. And you can tell the difference between the Gospels that are written early and then the pretenders that come later because of these specific details about 1st century culture. It's also interesting to note that when you get to the New Testament epistles, the letters, the Bible itself lets us know that there were collections of Paul's letters that had been assembled before the New Testament was even completed. Second Peter is one of the later books, but well, I don't know that I should say that. Second Peter is one of the books written in the first century AD, and it tells us at the end of Second Peter about the letters of Paul. Peter says, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. So even by the time Second Peter was written, in the first century, Peter lets the readers know that there were collections of Paul's letters, and that those letters were already regarded as scripture. So by looking inside the New Testament itself, and by looking at a little evidence around, you can see that the New Testament was written very, very early, and all the writing was done by 100 AD. Well, that brings us to the formation of a canon. The word canon just refers to an accepted group of authoritative books. So when we talk about the canon of the Bible, we're talking about the books that are regarded as authoritative in the Word of God and are put together in the Bibles that we have today. The Old Testament canon was set by Jesus' time. The Jews organized books of the Old Testament into three divisions, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. And that threefold division encompassed all the material that we find in our Old Testaments today. And by the time of Jesus, this threefold division was universally accepted as the authoritative, inscripturated Word of God. In fact, Jesus refers to these three divisions and assumes they're all inspired by God. For instance, I'll give you a couple of references. If you go to Luke chapter 24, you remember that Jesus, after he rose from the dead, was talking to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And in Luke 24, 27, it says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then a little later in the chapter, Jesus appears to his disciples. And it says in verse 44, And he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, everything, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So there it is, Jesus referring to the law, the prophets, 
and they're called the writings sometimes, but other times the other division of Scripture is referred to as the Psalms, and there Jesus referred to all three of them. Uh, one other reference I'll give you in the Sermon on the Mount. This one will probably ring a bell with you. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota nor a dot will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. There you have Jesus emphatically and specifically saying that these divisions of the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, are authoritative, and not one little squiggle will pass away from them. Sometimes, I will say parenthetically, the New Testament refers to the Old Testament as simply the law and the prophets. It's not that Jesus was saying the writings are not authoritative. He was just using the term law and prophets to refer to the Old Testament. So, in the early church, there was occasionally some disagreement about whether Esther or the Song of Solomon was really... Uh, it really ought to be included in the canon of the Old Testament. But, by and large, even by the time of Jesus, before the church, the Old Testament canon, the group of authoritative books, was set. The New Testament books were also recognized very early by the church. Sometimes, when you hear skeptics or liberal scholars or just opponents of Christianity talk about the formation of the New Testament, they act like there were a whole bunch of books and then early church officials just came along and arbitrarily picked some books and said, these are going to be the New Testament. And they arbitrarily excluded others that also gave valid information. That's not the way it happened at all. The New Testament books were not picked as much as they were recognized. In John chapter 10 and verse 27, Jesus talks about his sheep will know his voice. And the process of collecting the New Testament into the 27 books we have today was really the process of the early believers examining the writings that they had and listening for Jesus' voice and seeing what was, a, what was really the Lord Jesus and then taking those books and putting them into a collection. That's the canon. The early church really used three tests to determine whether a book was canonical, whether it was the Word of God that ought to be regarded as the New Testament. First, a book had to be written or endorsed by an apostle. The apostles were eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ who were specially appointed by him to be leaders in the early church. People like Peter and Paul and James. And no book was regarded as New Testament scripture unless it was written or endorsed by an apostle. Secondly, to be regarded as New Testament scripture, a book had to be consistent with the apostles' teaching and with the other scriptures. Even before there was written scripture, the apostles were establishing churches and preaching the gospel, handing down a message of salvation by grace alone, through faith, faith alone, in Christ alone. The early Christians knew that message, and they knew Christian doctrine. And so when a book came to them that purported to be scripture, they tested to see whether that book conformed with the doctrine they knew was the apostles' doctrine. And then thirdly, to be considered canonical scripture, a book had to be widely used in the churches as scripture. If a book didn't meet those three tests, then it wasn't regarded as a part of the Bible. It could be helpful, like there are many helpful Christian books, but it was not totally true inspired scripture as far as the early church was concerned. By the end of the second century, there were few Christians who would allow any gospels to be read in their churches, other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They, it was settled that those four were the ones that were the voice of Jesus. And then you might also be interested to note in that issue of Christian History Magazine, out of which your reading came, there is a table uh, called What Writings Must Christians Obey? It's not one that I assigned you, but you might be interested to take a look because it has four early lists of what books make up the New Testament. The lists are all things that were written before the year 400, different believers' opinions about what books made up the authoritative New Testament scripture. And it's so interesting that those lists are remarkably similar. Before there was any council or any official Christian pronouncement about what books were the New Testament, Christians agreed by and large. Now, there were some books here and there that Christians 
didn't always agree on. For instance, there are books called the Didache and the Shepherd of Hermas that some people regarded as scripture, others didn't. They didn't finally make the cut when things all got whittled down to the Bible we have today. But there are just those few exceptions. The bulk of the New Testament, believers could look at, and they could apply these three tests, and they could say, yes, we see in that the voice of Christ. So no council had to come on and, and make an arbitrary distinction between what books were the Bible and which weren't. The common believer and the common pastor that was shepherding the people were able to recognize the voice of Jesus and then use it in the churches. Um, by the early 400s, our 27 books were almost universally recognized without any sort of outlying disagreement. Your readings talk about more of this in more detail, but that's the writing of the New Testament, the formation of the canon, the collection of authoritative books. Now let's talk a little bit about the copying of the books. How did those early books come down to us? Because it's not as though you and I hold the same parchment or the same scrolls that the Christians in 200 or 300 AD were using. How do we get what we have? Well, you might be interested to know that we don't have any of the original manuscripts that were written by the prophets in the case of the New Testament, I mean in the case of the Old Testament, and by the apostles in the case of the New Testament. It might be good that we don't have any original manuscripts because I suspect that some believers would take them and put them in shrines and be worshiping those documents themselves and acting like they had mystical power when it's the words of the document that God meant for us to focus on. But just because we don't have the original manuscripts doesn't mean we don't know what the original manuscripts said. Because we have thousands of copies. The New Testament and the Old Testament were hand copied until really after the year A.D. 1000. There were thousands of years in which to get a copy of these books, scribes had to just write them down by hand. The great number of copies and the fact that the copies say the same thing shows us what the originals said. There are other works in antiquity that are regarded as, as important and we feel like we know what the originals said when there are not anywhere close to as many copies of those works as there are the Bible. The great, great, great number of manuscript copies of the Bible can give us great assurance that we know what the originals must have said. Now, there are some places where different copies of the Bible uh, have different wordings, and that's really to be expected when you start thinking about it. There are scribal errors, is what we call them. Imagine if you were a scribe, say in the year 600, and you were charged with copying by hand the entire book of 1 Corinthians. Well, imagine by the time you got to chapter 14 or 15 or 16, it was the end of the day and the light was poor and you were getting pretty sleepy and you could easily have written down a wrong word here and there. And then when it came to thousands of scribes copying thousands of portions of scripture over hundreds of years, there were a lot of different places where a scribe would make a little error here and there because he was sleepy or because he couldn't see or because he was distracted by something. And so we have little errors in the copies that way. We sometimes have theological additions to the copies of the Bible where a scribe might be reading along and decide, you know what, that verse doesn't seem quite as polished as it ought to be or maybe it ought to say this and it doesn't. And so the scribe might try to make the verse sound a little better. Well, despite his good intentions, that's still a deviation from what the original author wrote. And the original author's writing is what we're, in, what we're interested in. So, there are those little variations in the manuscripts, but there's a whole discipline called textual criticism, uh, where scholars look at the differences in manuscripts and try to determine what the original must have said. And they can do that with great accuracy. I ought to stop here and say that the little differences in different manuscripts of the Bible don't compromise any doctrine of Christianity. And in fact, the, they really are minutiae. They're not major, major important things that are different from manuscript to manuscript. Still, we have ways, like I said, to know what the original probably said, and it is important to know what the original probably said, where the people copying the manuscripts have made errors. One way we can know what the original said is by looking at the oldest manuscripts. A lot of times the oldest will be closest to the original. Not always, but a lot of times. Uh, 
Sometimes the greatest number of manuscripts tell us what a verse says. If we have ten manuscripts that have one reading and one manuscript that has another reading, well, then it would be logical to think that the ten probably reflect the original, and the one was a sleepy scribe or a scribe that thought he would help out the original author by adding something. And then, I think this last one is interesting, sometimes we can tell what the original reading was by looking at what the least likely reading was. In other words, if you have one reading here and one reading here for a verse, and this reading seems a little clunky or a little awkward, and then this reading seems really smooth and theologically good, odds are it was the slightly more clunky and less obviously theologically good uh, version that was the original. And the reason is, you can imagine that a scribe came across that and thought he would correct it. But it's hard to imagine that a scribe came across a verse that was really smooth and clear, and he decided to make it less smooth. So, greatest number of manuscripts, oldest manuscripts, and least likely reading are three ways that scholars can kind of get at what the original reading probably was. Let me give you just a few little examples of where the differences in manuscripts make a difference in our Bible. I have here an ESV, English Standard Version, and a King James Version. These two versions of the Bible rely on different manuscripts to be translated. And if you look at John 1.18 in the English Standard Version, once I turn to it, I'll, I'll read it to you. John 1.18 says, No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. Well, when you turn to John 1.18 in the King James Version, it says, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. The ESV calls Jesus the only begotten, the only God, and the King James calls Him the only Son. It's not a big deal, but it just is because there were different manuscripts that the two different translators were using. Here is one of the most famous. 1 John chapter 5 verses 6 and 8, 6 through 8, I should say. I'm going to read the King James first. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. It's a very clear reference to the Trinity in the King James Version. But, go to the ESV. The ESV is actually based on more accurate manuscripts, uh, which I'll have to explain a little more later. But the ESV says, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. No mention of the Trinity. Well, the reason is, because we can tell from the manuscripts that somewhere along the line, somebody added that reference to the Trinity. It sounds really good. And the Trinity is a biblical doctrine that we can find all over the Bible. But it's just not mentioned in this verse. And so, somewhere along the line, a scribe decided to make the text seem a little better to help it out, so he added this, but it's not in the original manuscript. The King James has that reading with the Trinity mentioned. The ESV has what we know is the more accurate reading without the Trinity mentioned in that verse. Um, there are others. For instance, the end of Mark. Uh, most manuscripts... End with at the end of Mark in chapter 16, end with verse 8. But then there's this extra section at the end of Mark, verses 9 through 20. And scholars debate, depending on the manuscripts they're looking at, whether Mark 16, verses 9 through 20 was in the original. You read an interview with Bruce, Bruce Metzger, a famous Old Testament scholar, and he says that Mark did not write Mark 16, 9 through 20. It was a later edition. But he thinks it's a legitimate part of the New Testament because many in the early church used it. But when I read that, I tended to disagree. I think that if the original manuscripts are inerrant, if the original writer is what God really inspired to be true and trustworthy, then 
we shouldn't we should elevate the original above later editions. So I think if Mark didn't write Mark 16, 9 through 20, then we can view it as helpful, but probably not as scripture in the same way we view the rest of Mark as scripture. That doesn't compromise any doctrine because it talks about the resurrection appearances and other parts of the Bible that are obviously authentic originals also talk about the resurrection. But uh, Mark 16 is another place where it's, where it's debated what manuscripts actually reflect the original reading. I actually got to thinking about Mark 16 as I was getting ready to record this video. And even though on the one hand, my initial thought was we shouldn't regard Mark 16, 9 through 20 as scripture because it's not by Mark. Then I got to thinking, well, at the end of Deuteronomy, it talks about Moses' death, and it talks about what happened after Moses' death. Moses wrote Deuteronomy, but he obviously did not write the part about what happened after his death, unless God somehow supernaturally revealed that to him and had him write it down. But I think someone else wrote the very end of Deuteronomy. But that doesn't make us think that the end of Deuteronomy is inauthentic, or that should not be considered scripture. So maybe it is with Mark, that even if somebody else added it later, if the early church recognized it as authoritative scripture, maybe we should too. Uh, I'm just kind of talking through the issue here with you and telling you that Mark 16 is one of those passages where there are differences in the different manuscripts that people have copied. So we have to weigh through those issues when we're trying to decide what the original reading actually was and what should be our scripture. But the bottom line of all this discussion is that after the New Testament and the Old Testament were written, and after the canon was formed, then the books were copied over time by scribes. When the printing press was invented, then the copying could be far more widely distributed, and then you could do a lot more copying without errors when you didn't have to do it all by hand. And then finally, that brings me to the last heading, and that's the Bible.